This is IAQ Radio, indoor air quality radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus, episode 666. This week, we've got a little change of pace for you. Uh, we're only going to we're going to play back a new show that I recorded recently with the hosts of the Edifice Complex podcast, Robert Bean and Adam Muggleton. Robert's been on the show before. Adam, this will be his first time. This was a really wide ranging show. We talked about podcasting, indoor air quality, building science, and disaster restoration. We may not have solved all the world's problems, but we did at least start to define what's needed. This was a thought-provoking show and a great time with two worldly Canadians, one of whom is a transplant from the UK. I'm sure you'll be able to figure that out by his accent. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue doing the show. Don't forget, after the show, continue the discussion at afterthoughts.iaqradio.com, sponsored by First On Site. And the Z-Man and I will still be online texting and answering questions through the chat. Our marquee sponsor is First On Site at firstonsite.com. Our association sponsors are the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, ACGIH.org, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, AIHA.org, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute, CIRIScience.org, the Indoor Air Quality Association, IAQA.org, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, IICRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus, ParticlesPlus.com. TSI Inc., TSI.com. Sunbelt Rentals, SunbeltRentals.com. April Air, April, A-I-R-E.com. Healthy Indoors Magazine, HealthyIndoors.com. Welcome to the Edifice Complex. I'm Robert Bean, your co-host and unofficial mediator here with my colleague, official agitator, friend, and Yoda of everything to do with buildings, Mr. Adam Muggleton. Say hello, Sir Adam. Hello there. So this is interesting. This is like that Star Trek episode where they're into a parallel world, right? If two <laughs> podcasters who of a certain age meet two podcasters of a certain age, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny, we, um, you know, as some of you know, uh, the pod, our podcast, Edifice Complex Podcast, came about from a bar discussion. <laughs> I don't even know where, I can't remember, were we in Albuquerque, Adam? It was, uh, it was in the US somewhere, but it was an ashray meeting, I, and you were on a break, and I was on a break from something, and we, I cornered you in a bar and pitched you, I remember that. Yeah, and that's how it all started, and, yeah. and then in this parallel universe was this other podcast that out of all the podcasts i think in the in the world of buildings and property development uh was a leader and i ended up on the show a couple of times and always was a big fan and i think today before we introduce our guest um there i think they're like 660 episodes or 670 episodes like Hello. you know it's it's an it's an archive of probably some of the most smartest people uh, that I know of anywhere when it comes to, comes to buildings and uh, individuals within buildings and the whole science of indoor environmental quality and architecture and the building sciences. So we have uh, a guest on today that uh, is one of the founders and that's uh, Joe Hughes from uh, IAQ uh, Radio. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you, Adam. Welcome. It's great to be here. Yeah. I'm sorry, Robert. I, I don't know who was speaking. Robert was speaking. <laughs> there, right? <laughs> so unfortunately, I'm not used to being on this side of things here, Robert. So <laughs> be patient with me. <laughs> so yeah, well, you know, Joe, like sometimes you have your foot on the boat and some on the dock, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so we don't. Unfortunately, we don't have Cliff with you today, and um, but we do send our best regards to Cliff because he's the other part of your team there the tag team tell us like how did you get started i mean you guys have been a, just a leader in this whole world and give us give our listeners sort of a, a background story well the, the z man cliff zlotnick who's my my co-host here he uh he and i also have 
a company called IAQ Training Institute, and, and we did training for mold remediation, indoor environmental quality inspection. Um, we've done some other training as well uh, over the years, mostly to do with uh, water damage, disaster restoration, those types of things. He was listening to a business show one time, and he heard one of the guests talk about this new podcasting thing. This is almost 16 years ago. Mm. Now we started this show and um, it was a business show and they were talking about how they had invested in and they were putting together this podcasting uh, platform, I guess you would call it called talk shoe and uh, sort of like the old Maxwell smart, you know, you talk into the shoe. And um, so he said, you know, Joe, I think, I think you'd be good at this and I I'd be happy to help out with it. So why don't we give it a try? And here we are 16 years later, we're kind of the, the old guard in uh, the podcasting realm. We've since switched over. Well, not switched over. We've expanded what we do and we now do a YouTube video as well as a podcast that we put up on Podbean. Yeah. So the list of your guests, Really, Joe, it's there. It's like the who's who. <laughs> and do you remember who your first guest was? <laughs> Bad question. <laughs> well, I, I think it might have been maybe Harriet Burge. Uh, I know Dr. Dietrich Weil, who was our, yeah. um, he, he was our technical director at the time. And he, he was with us for about six or seven, maybe even eight years. I know he was on the show. I think maybe Harriet Burge. And I remember a show we did way back. It was called Carpet Monsters and Killer Spores. And the name of the gentleman that um, we had on, he was a professor at the Miami of Ohio uh, University and had just written this book and uh, had put it out. And the name will come to me as we go along here. But uh, I believe he was on one of the earliest shows as well. Yeah. Wow. Well, you, when you think about, and I guess one of the things that I also am impressed with the show is that, um, at, you know, as you've been on your continuum, you've, you know, gone on both sides and expanded into multiple disciplines, like not just air quality, but it's been the building sciences and it's been the human sciences. And you've sort of created this basket of knowledge that's invaluable. Well, we've, we've got three baskets essentially the indoor air quality basket where we've had people like dr burge and j david miller and uh don weeks and 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 many others that are well known in that arena but we also wanted to cover disaster restoration in in part because that's a part of indoor air quality obviously when you're dealing with disasters and the cleanup afterwards you're one of your first focuses should be, you know, how will the air quality be when we're done with this project? Mm-hmm. And also because Cliff was a pioneer in the disaster restoration world. He, he manufactured products. He did training programs. He's been involved in disaster restoration for 45 years or so now. And we realized early on as well that the importance of building science to both of those areas um, from, you know, we were going to Joe's uh, Joe Steebrook's building science mm-hmm. summer camp for a long time. Now cliff was one of the first people up there in the very early days. And we realized that we needed to talk about building science as well. And that's when we got people, a lot of the ashray type people um, yourself and, and many others involved with the show. Mm. Yeah. I've, I've got to say 16 years, tip of the hat for being <laughs> early in man that 16 years ago i don't think i was even aware of a thing called a podcast and i'm a tech nerd so tip of the hat on that 16 years that's a lot of consistency and i think when you're doing a a show like ours and yours you know consistency really matters people need to know it's coming need to know it's of a certain level right and it's going to be worthwhile at that time so well done on that i have to say um Yeah, and you know the guest list speaks for itself, really. But just on the the restoration side of it, that must be a growing area, right? I mean, how many? I can't. Every time you turn the news on, there's a flood, there's a hurricane, there's this, there's that, and there's houses being wiped out. So I guess in in the states, particularly, because it's such a big territory, right? There must that must be a 
a growing sector, right? Yes, it is. And it's, um, it's a sector that's become uh, more popular with venture capitalists as well. Uh, there's a lot of money pouring into that sector. There are large companies now that didn't exist five years ago that are buying up disaster restoration companies and, and putting them under the umbrella of whatever. It, for instance, one of our best sponsors is First On Site. Right. Uh, First On Site's a big restoration company nationwide. I believe they'll probably be going worldwide. And uh, there's a lot of money going into the disaster restoration world. It's it's very interesting area. Fascinates me. So there's a uh, there's two schools of thought on that, right? So should insurance companies be insuring properties that are in disaster zones, right? Because there's a yep. moral hazard to that, right? Yep. Uh, but the flip side of that is why not? And it creates jobs, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes the cynical side of me kicks in, but you know, disaster. I I'm a big fan of restoration. One of my favorite pro building projects is where they take an old building that's derelict and repurpose it and reuse it. Uh, a great example of that in the UK is an old power station called the Tate. Mod they took an old power station in, on the Thames in London and repurposed it into a modern a, a museum of modern art. And they really kept the structure and everything. So that whole building got a brand new lease of life. Mm -hmm. That is restoration for me. That's the winds there are great. You're not knocking it down. You're not losing the embodied carbon. You're repurposing it. You know, it, I love that. I think that should be a much bigger sex than it actually is. But that's just me. Well, and I, I think disaster restoration, as opposed to just, you know, restoration, yeah is also something that's growing worldwide. I, I know in the UK that they, they've been dealing with disaster restoration for many years, but it's now a very, it, it's an up and coming thing in Australia and, and in the rest of Europe. Um, this, this whole idea of trying to respond to fires and floods and earthquakes and things of that nature. Um, many people are seeing that there's a definite need there and um, they're jumping in and, and getting involved in that business. Interesting. Because building construction and engineering was just too easy in the beginning. We may as well throw disasters in there now, right? <laughs> well, like an equation, right? I mean, you know, I mean, but you're, you're a commissioning guy and, 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 and you guys are involved in helping people get buildings designed and built and so on. There's a, much bigger emphasis now on not just designing and building a healthy building, but a resilient building that, mm -hmm. that, that's going to stand up to things like heat waves and fires and smoke and, and water damage, because it's, it's going to happen. Something I'm seeing in the UK uh, was really interesting. So it's almost becoming politically unacceptable to knock down big buildings and rebuild them because of the loss of embodied carbon. Yeah. The most sustainable building is the one you don't knock down, right? But the one you retrofit. So there's an, a job, a great example, there's a skyscraper in, in London and they were going to knock it down and build a new one and then the mob came for them on social media and in the end they backed down and did it as a resto mod. So they took it back to the, and they just go reclad it and redo it. So it's still a massive project, right? massive 350 million pound, that's a five, half a billion dollar project, but they're not knocking it down. And I think restoration and resto mods, it's a bit like cars, right? Resto mod Porsches. I think buildings, the building sector is going to move towards resto mods. In that, you know, you've got a downtown core, you've got a skyscraper. Let's not knock it down. Let's repurpose it. You know? So I don't know. That's I think that business is an undiscovered future growth business, in my opinion. Mm. I would agree. And I, I it's funny you mentioned cars because um, there are some similarities with the way auto insurance and disaster uh, homeowners insurance have kind of uh, grown over the years. You know, it, it used to be when you wrecked your car, you could take it anywhere and uh, they would fix it up and you'd send the bill to the insurance company. The insurance company would pay it. Well, if you've been involved in an accident here recently, you'll know that more often than not, you're going to take photos of what happened. You're not going to see an insurance adjuster. You're going yeah. to take it to their preferred provider, and they have much more control over the costs and the quality 
of the repairs. Um, there's been similar trends, or, or at least they've tried similar things in the disaster restoration world, but it's a lot more difficult because you've got so many different variables as opposed to a car, you know, which is a, it can be very complex, but, um, you know, different buildings and different geographies, different climates, different, mm. uh, you know, different sizes, different uh, reasons for having that building. I mean, it's, it's, they haven't been able to, at this point, standardize the insurance side of things as much as they have on the auto collision side of things. Yeah. Now that brings a question in terms of, and I know both you and Cliff went through this uh, with a number of associations. So not only in terms of the standardization and um, certifications, but, you know, we see it in the commissioning world where there's many commissioning agent uh, 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 associations, just like there has been many associations in the restoration business. And you, I don't remember what year it was, Joe, but there was a lot of turmoil that went on in terms of merging organizations and that oh. kind of stuff. How did that all eventually spin out? Were you able to pull everybody yeah. together? Well, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a challenging time. Um, when, you know, the, at, at the time, the Indoor Air Quality Association was a you know, big player in, in the uh, indoor air quality world. They've since kind of tapered off quite a bit and, I, they, I believe, and a lot of the leadership believe that um, part of the reason they tapered off was the fact that they had this kind of consolidation that didn't go quite as well as they would have liked. Although the certifying group, I think, is pretty happy with uh, what they've ended up with. That's the American Council for Accredited Certification. Um, but Indoor Air Quality Association kind of has lost their uh, their main reason for people coming to them back in the early days was to get certified in either mold remediation or as an indoor environmentalist. When they gave that up to the ACAC, I think it hurt them. Um, and it, it's been a tough climb to get back into being relevant in the, in the world again, in the industry again. And um, during that time, you've also seen groups like, you know, ASHRAE's gotten much more involved in indoor air quality. Um, the IICRC, which is the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning and Restoration Certification, they are much more involved in uh, indoor air quality as opposed to just disaster restoration. So they've, they've kind of branched into that area a little bit more. And, and again, it's squeezed out the Indoor Air Quality Association. But uh, Recently, in the restoration on the restoration side, the good news is that you know the IICRC and the Restoration Industry Association are working a lot more closely together and and a lot more cooperatively. So, it's been a mixed bag. Yeah, I you know well Adam and we've talked about this when we've had people from different associations on, yeah. and I think ultimately that society uh, benefits when there's consistency within certification programs. Yes. Yeah. And um, it's difficult to make that happen when you have three or four or five different associations and they're all trying to create a, le a leadership position. But it just, you know, I'm all for competition and I'm all for, you know, the free market as much as the crap it creates. Yeah. Uh, but there is a need for, for the benefit of society, a consistent message and consistent yeah. in certification. I, I, I just think well, that's the uh, way to go. I'm curious on the commissioning side. Um, it's been a while since I've really looked at it, but uh, how many different certifications are there? On, on, and are they third-party accredited certifications? That was the big thing oh, back in the day. Me here. You've asked the right question. So, <laughs> <laughs> at this point, you know, the market wants a single source of truth and a single source authority, right? Yep. That's what the desire is. And let's just take building design in general, ASHRAE tends to fill that that role, you know, as a lobbying and as a source of guides. And, you know, if you get, if you're, if you're taken to court and you've designed uh, the building world, you use, you reference the ASHRAE guys to show that you've done it properly, right? In commissioning, there are, last time I checked, it was a few years ago, there are 16 different certifications to become a commissioning provider. Some consist of a weekend in a hotel. Wow conference room and the others consist of eight hour engineering exams right so there's a continuum of 
rubbish to quality, right? The trouble is the market has a real problem identifying which is the good, the bad, and the ugly in that 16. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the reasons commissioning doesn't get taken as seriously as it should. So commissioning industry really does need a consolidation, serious consolidation down to two or three max. Um, you know, uh, I talk about this sometimes at conferences. So I was speaking at the Building Commission Association conference. And at the end of my presentation, I started talking about them merging with this other firm. And the president shouted out to me, Adam, you're doing this again? Stop it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> So, we had Jerry, um, we had Jerry Udelson on um, a couple of times, actually. And I think, well, Jerry, I think was saying at one point, well, you know what? I think there's as many as as many shows that you and Cliff have done, Joe, there's the same <laughs> amount of building programs. Oh, there's over 600. Certifications. There's What's that? Six, green building certifications are over 600 in the world. Yeah. Legally, wow. You know, 600. If there was ever, uh, you know, the, the, the phrase paralysis through analysis, right? <laughs> There's no better example. How the hell does somebody, you know, choose or follow? I mean, it's, um, I don't know, the ethos in, in the well program, for example. I, I'm a big fan of the well program, uh, the passive house, active house, you know, those all have seemed, they all seem like living building challenge is another one. You know, the ethos of those programs are good. But how do you pack, you know? It's, it's a thing called, um, there's, there's, a, there's an economic name for it. It's called overproduction of elites, certification inflation, right? Mm. So whenever I hire people, if they have like five or six acronyms off their name, that's a red flag for me. They're credential chasers. That, the amount of credentials after someone's name is inversely proportional to how actually good they are. <laughs> because uh, no you got me thinking course. right now I'm, I'm thinking of an email i just saw the other day with the list of certifications behind his name that was a mile long and yeah yeah, uh, you know, yeah. If, if you're an engineer you need one thing after you know it says pe done that's it no one yeah. needs to know anything else about you don't want to know you got a master's or what your mum thinks. All we need to know is that you're a licensed engineer. That's it. Then after that, it's about your work, your body of work, right? I used to love when, when we were doing uh, seminars for ASHRAE and uh, as a moderator, you know, and you'd get these individuals with their resumes and the resume was longer than their presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a second. You know, like we're here for the content right if any we want resume, to know how great you are we can go online and we can search up your name right resume. any resume more than one page is a crime against humanity more than a <laughs> sentence I, I just say that when everybody's going to introduce me you just say try just a single sentence the only exception to that is joe is when you guys read my resume <laughs> well i've got your your current title is retired i like that Robert. that's it that's, <laughs> see, that's all you need to know <laughs> I may have to steal that from you. I don't have a title behind my name. I may have to put retired or semi-retired. I don't know. Use the acting acronym is resting. Yeah. Resting. There you go. Uh, I like that. I am trying to. Hey, by the way, I got. I. I, I want to get the correct answer for the one question. The first show was Nicholas Money, who wrote Carpet Monsters and Killer Spores, mm. a natural history of toxic mold. And then Glenn Fellman, who was the mm -hmm. at the time the um, executive director of the Indoor Air Quality Association, and I, I'd be really feel bad if I neglected to mention Tom Yacobellis. Um, Tom at the time was with Duct Busters. He was a uh, big HVAC cleaning guy and and, mm -hmm. and very respected in the area. And he's now with uh, Belfour. Oh, wow. um, or yeah, they went from Duck Busters to Ducks to, and they became. Um, the Belfour arm that does the HVAC systems cleaning and uh, very, very knowledgeable guy. In fact, they were on, I can't remember the name of the cruise ship, but the first cruise ship that got, um, that, that, that got quarantined in Japan when oh, COVID right. first started, yeah. they cleaned that up and we did a fascinating show on that. In fact, we'll, we'll have to post that as a part of this. Uh, we'll a link in the show notes. Yeah. So let's talk about IAQ, because like restoration, like disaster restoration, there's a there's an IAQ component to that. Your first 
episode as an IAQ component to that mold and health, right? And having just gone through the pandemic, IAQ now is a much bigger conversation than it used to be, right? People talk about CO2 levels. So, you know, IAQ, I think, is one of the less understood but more important things that nobody really talks about. I'd love to see um, more CO2 con demand control type strategies, uh, you know, DOAS dedicated outside air ventilation solutions. Because, you know, taking that um, cruise ship, you know how they all got ill. It was all recirculated farts going around, right? It was all recirculated air going everywhere. You know, so yeah. I'm surprised the IAQ industry is not bigger than it is. You've got any thoughts on that? You know, I, I think it, it's bigger than we realize because it's not consolidated under one. Even we don't even have a proper name for it. Um, you know, I, I we used IAQ Radio because back in the day when we started this, IAQ indoor air quality was more common as a description of of the type of thing we were doing than what is used today, which is indoor environmental quality. Um, right. Most people use IEQ, so I know that. The way we describe and name things has been a real problem for, if you want to call it, the industry yeah. over the years. Um, I want to mention also another group that's very involved with, with indoor air quality, and that's the American Industrial Hygiene Association. And mm. they are the, the good old, they're like the IAQ radio of the, you know, of the occupational and environmental health world. They just keep chugging along with that one excellent yeah, certification, yeah. the certified industrial hygienist. So yeah. in the IAQ world, IEQ world, if there was one designation, I would say is probably the most respected other than, you know, PEs and so on, it would be the CIH, the certified industrial hygienist. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that for sure. Yeah. The, the problem there is that most of the CIHs of the world they're more involved with commercial type work or, you know, industrial workplaces, and they didn't really focus yeah. much on residential. And when residential indoor air quality became a kind of hot topic back in the you know 2000 era after this particular uh, mold case called Ballard versus Farmers Insurance, and uh, another case up in Cleveland where some children died from, uh, pulmonary lung bleeding essentially and they at first thought it might have been re related to their uh, exposure to some mold yeah the industrial hygienists were focused more on you know commercial spaces workplaces and when this mm -hmm. you know these incidents occurred in residential homes it kind of left a, a bit of a gap there that somebody needed to fill in yeah, and that's right. when groups like the Indoor Air Quality Association and, and at the time, the American Council, the American Indoor Air Quality Council, I believe they were called, right. and a few other organizations started to develop these training courses and certifications for indoor environmental quality to kind of fill that gap. You know, you, you've got a, a residential indoor air quality or mold problem. If you call a CIH, they may or may not be familiar with that type of work and they're probably going to be a little more expensive than your typical mold guy that uh you know learned some things in a course through indoor air quality association or others and, and i think they filled a a need that was you know, that was there i mean it, you know we didn't have to have a uh very qualified certified industrial hygienist op to look at an indoor air quality issue we needed more generalists and, and where we really needed help was they had to understand industrial hygiene so they could take samples and evaluate situations, assess the conditions. But in my opinion, always more importantly, they needed to understand building science more than the traditional industrial hygienists did. Uh, at the time, industrial hygienists were, you know, focused more on occupational uh, exposures and assessments and so on. And over time, they also have you know, gotten much better with building science, but that whole building science component was kind of missing. And I think the IAQA and other groups kind of helped to fill in the gap by getting people to understand, you know, how does the HVAC system in combination with the building envelope 
make indoor air quality either better or worse? And um, how can we improve it? It wasn't so much that we needed to measure things as we needed to figure out what was wrong and then fix it uh, and then clean up the mess. Joe, I'm so glad you said that because if you recall, and I don't remember what year, um, but the event took place. You had uh, I and uh, Professor Tang Lee on. Yep. And that was shortly after I wrote the first edition of the uh, Indoor Air Quality Awareness Course for the Heating and Refrigeration Air Conditioning Institute of Canada. You actually were one of the reviewers on that, if I remember correctly. Yes. And I remember um, one of the challenges I had writing that course was uh, the pushback against including building science in the program hmm. and some of the hygiene the hygienist type stuff also went into the program and the industry and i'm not this is just the industry in general when you say the word ia cube people's brains automatically go to hvac yeah they think about they think about filtration they think about humidity they think that represents <clears throat> into air quality <laughs> the reality is that's this much you know and when you think about, and you've had Joe Stebrick on uh, several times, I think, and yep. talking about damage functions and moisture is the number one damage function and, you know, building failures due to all kinds of moisture related issues. Well, that's not in the HVAC camp per se. I mean, there's dehumidification, which is part of it, but where that water comes from, how it's, how it's not controlled and the resulting damage is something that most HVAC people aren't trained in. Right. Uh, so we, we, we still have that challenge today. And uh, but anyways, I just wanted to bring that up because you were, you were part of that in the, in the, in the very beginning, but I totally agree with you on the, the that show was in 2009, by the way. So was it really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> quite a while, yeah. quite a while. But yeah. I, what I, I guess what I would ask you, you two is, and I, I don't see much of this, but it seems like there should be, a better building science curriculum available for anyone that wants to understand building science that, that may, you know, that's a part of their project facility managers, you know, HVAC people, indoor air quality people, they all need to understand building science. And I don't know that there's much available, you know, Joe Stebrook does a great job with his fundamentals of building science program, but uh, once he do it three, four, five times a year for 20, 25 people, that's just, not enough. Um, do you see anything on the horizon? No. Well, there is curriculums that um, I think it was, uh, well, Waterloo is one. And then um, I think Carlton has a program and the uh, U of T has a program, but those are all master's level courses. We need, we need something that's down on the, like you said, you know, the, the sort of the ground level, a uh, training program. You, you need uh, think, practitioner level training. Now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's the practitioners that are going to implement this, right? And mm -hmm. the reason it's not widely available, because you're talking about bringing a Venn diagram together here, right? So you talk about building science. Uh, you need systems thinking. You need building systems understanding, right? You know, just basic things like building pressurization and filtration is, to me, sounds simple. When I... Yeah, you know, I just throw that into conversations on projects. You know, is this building positively pressurized? And the blank looks that come back at me. You know, it's like, <laughs> I yeah. don't understand why the diffusers are dripping water in my lobby. I can tell you why. It's called building <laughs> pressurization, you know? And yeah. this is pretty basic stuff, right? So yeah. you've got to get it into college level, junior college level, and onwards. So it actually, I think, needs to be taught at, Let's take a four-year degree, right? So that one, four years is too long. Stop that. But let's pretend you can't stop that, right? Two years of fundamentals. Then you need two years of applied engineering. And within that is a systems thinking course, a building science course, a building systems course about how they all overlap and interact because it's the interactions that matter, right? Yeah. At the moment, our industry is siloed and thinks of IOQ in a in isolation and building science in isolation no one's drawing those links between them and it's the links that really matter yeah right? that's right well i think we, oh, we've had... oh, that's a bit of a rant i need to calm down <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe, well let's have... take it a, a step further here Adam. um why not have this in k-12 through schools 
I mean, we're teaching science. What, what better way to teach science than to tell, to, to use the, the kids' own home yeah. as, as the best example they can think of, of of the type of scientific principles we're talking about, things like condensation. Why, when you take a shower in the winter, does water condense on the window? Exactly. These are things that people, even when they're done with college, oftentimes don't understand as well as they should. I mean, I, I think it should start even earlier. You know, and well, I, that is a great comment. Point because that could be cut, that could be part of a final year physics class, like applied physics. And then you're creating a generation that's going to understand that and demand that and create a demand for that, right? Well, an educated buyer now looking at buying buildings, houses, for example, yeah. right? I mean, we, there's people, I, I, to this day, I can't believe like people will spend thousands and thousands of mo- uh, dollars and hours doing research work on vacations, automobiles, <laughs> if they got to get surgery, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll investigate to the nth degree, right? But when they spend a half a million or a million dollars on a house, they'll hand over the responsibility of the indoor environmental quality to somebody who doesn't know anything about indoor environmental quality. Okay. Like it's insane. And then they'll get a house without a user's manual. <laughs> right. I, I, I bought a cardio something, you know, the other day. It's got a user's manual that comes with it. But the biggest purchase I ever made in my life had no user's manual whatsoever. I had to figure it out on my own. And, and that's just crazy. I mean, we're, 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 way, we're backwards on these things. We've, yeah, we've got user's totally. manuals on the simplest things, but not on the most complex thing we deal with on a daily basis. Yeah. But you're onto something there. Someone going into like senior sort of high school level and getting this in the curriculum and creating a bit of a rah rah for the industry as well, right? Come on into yeah. this. I have a career here. There's a career That's here. A, There's things to fix. You know that creates demand, and you know the only way the construction industry is going to change is if people stop buying rubbish and demand what they should have, right? Well, and the other problem yeah. we have is there there aren't real good, clear career paths in indoor air quality. Um, how do you become an indoor air quality consultant? You know, there's no clear path toward that. In fact, right now it's a, it's a mix of mash of things. Mm. And a lot of the people in the indoor air quality world came in from other areas like HVAC, or a lot of them, believe it or not, actually were people who had problems got sick. No one could figure out what their problem was. So they decided to go out and experiment on their own and figure it out. And some of the best inspectors that uh, Jeff may comes to mind, right. uh, some of the best people out there doing this type of work came from a situation where they were ill for whatever reason, from an indoor environmental quality issue. And they had to figure it out on their own. Carl Grimes comes to mind. Uh, May Dooley, who these are all people who've been on my show and they're, they're really well respected in the industry. Do you know, one of the things I like about the insurance sector in the U.S., because it's such a big, powerful sector there, they have the ability, that sector has the ability to affect change, right? Like NFPA is born out of that, right? You know, it's maybe that's the angle, just sort of at a macro level. You know, they start incentivizing and disincentivizing through premiums and claims, behavior towards iaq and better construction now how you lobby for that i don't know but you know the, the insurance sector is one of the few sectors that is like the eight thousand pound gorilla that can actually get things done right you know? but, That's uh, a good point. our marquee sponsor is first on site your trusted full service disaster recovery and property restoration company at firstonsite.com Association sponsors are ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org, AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org, The Cleaning Industry Research Institute, See More Deeply Through Science and Research, CIRI. 
Science.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association, IAQA.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, IICRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, free shipping, great pricing, same day results with no rush fee, AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus. Feature-rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us. Particlesplus.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations. TSI.com. Sunbelt Rentals. Availability, reliability, and ease for all your IAQ and restoration needs at sunbeltrentals.com. April Air, healthy air, healthy home, April, A-I-R-E.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers, healthyindoors.com. Uh, let me ask on, on your side with building more efficient buildings. I saw an article the other day that, that <clears throat> there is starting to be some... Uh, incentive through insurance and other other ways to get people to build better buildings in the first place or to re renovate them properly. Do you see that? Uh, so I was talking about this on a call earlier today. There are sort of three things that drive building efficiency. One of them is the cost of energy. And in North America, that's low. So that isn't really a driver. I don't care what anyone says. It's not. Um, the next one is legislation. And then the one after that is like competing uh, on um, virtue signaling, like lead, right? The genius of lead is in America where and Canada where energy costs are very low in comparison to the rest of the world, lead creates a motive to do better, to do better with sustainability and energy efficiency, right? So you compete on virtue. I've got gold, he's got platinum, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right? So that is the genius of lead. But the real thing, the only, only thing that really does move the needle, insurance industry notwithstanding, is legislation, right? Now, again, in North America, that's hard because we have this multi-layer government, you know, local authority, state, federal. So it's very hard to get things changed. And, like, you know, how many building codes are in America? There's 50 states, there's international building code, there's federal, yeah. It's a bloody nightmare of confusion, right? <laughs> so, well, yeah. that's where your colleague, you know, we had him on the show and he said that change will occur at the municipal level. It'll, it mm. won't be federal. It won't be national. Yes. It'll be individual yeah. municipalities saying, okay, we're done. We're, we have to change what we're doing. It was a good comment. And that was, I don't know how many years ago, but that was. Yeah, that's a so side. I'm working with him now. He, he's a yeah. he's a clever guy. And he's right because he's seen that where he is. Uh, the most effective change in the Middle East has really come from municipal governments who are just saying, I'm. Yeah, we want to be better. We want to attract better investment. We want to attract, you know, like these transnational firms. So they've taken it on themselves to legislate locally to, to do that. Another area I think that does push change is legal issues and, and the legal uh, ramifications of letting your building get to the point where people are developing health issues as a result of your poor yeah. planning or negligence or poor maintenance or whatever it may be. Do you see that? Like, I, I, I'm still wondering what the, um, so what the blowback has been from that large cladding fire that was in the oh, UK. Yeah, exactly. Adam, you're over there. You, yeah. you probably dealt with this quite a bit. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So just, uh, just on the, on the litigation thing, litigation, uh, is an effective tool in the U.S. because the way the U.S. courts work, I mean, they're based on English common law, which is sort of pretty common in most places to go, but the, the awards in U.S. courts can be very high. So that acts as an incentive and disincentive in and of itself, and the insurance industry is tied into that, right? But in the U.K., there was a fire, just for uh, our listeners, about, oh, it's about four years ago now. Yeah. There's a tower, an old tower called the Grenfell Tower in London, it was a residential town that had been reclad, and there was a fire, and the fire spread to the cladding, and the cladding spread the fire across vertically, vertically up and down the horizontal. So the fire spread really fast, and there, it was a disaster. I mean, 
it was the worst disaster since uh, the bombing of London in World War II. I mean, I can't remember, so many plus people died. It was just horrific. Now, the, the UK's government reaction to that was, because the UK is not like, you know, state, federalist. The government can be quite fast to react there. So they went nuts. They wanted to put someone in jail for this, right? So, I mean, they literally went crazy. And they couldn't pin it on anyone, right? Mm. Because of the lack of information, the lack of uh, mm. documentation on design decisions, they couldn't pin it on. The cladding wasn't really up to snuff. It didn't meet certain things, but that wasn't documented. There was So then they went for the architects who passed it on to the engineer. There was just this circle of it's not me, it's him. And the next issue was they couldn't pin it on anyone. So what they've done is they've uprated and changed all the building regulations. And that's just coming into law now. It's called the Building Safety Act. And they're doing a thing so that what they're bringing in is accountability. So they're doing a thing called the golden thread. So every design decision going forward after this law is enacted will have to be documented. So if there's ever another Grenfell, someone goes to jail. Hmm. Right. So they're calling this the golden thread. So every design decision has to be documented with a name and uh, the uh, information about the materials that selected, the design decision behind it, who made it. And then the building control, which is the authority having jurisdiction, there's going to be personal liability on them as well. A lot of people are leaving and retiring. They've gone, well, oh, no, it's time out. <laughs> but so <laughs> we're moving into a world, and I think this will cross the pond eventually, this, this level of accountability, because the, the what's happening there for the design teams now, they're all developing software to, to capture all this because they have to by law and then archive it, right? So I think this will cross over the Atlantic at some point. Now, this leads me on to my, I'm always a bit of a sort of futurologist. You know, with the technology that's available to us now, let's take IEQ, for example, right? Not many people know it, but it's like 12 points. So how many sort of different vectors are on it, right? We're in a world now or very soon to be where you could measure these, all these things, humidity, temperature, noise level, VOCs accurately. With a, with a cheapish device that could be networked and could send data into a cloud, but also you could control off them things, right? You can alarm off them things. So I think maybe 10, 20 years from now, you'll be buying a house where all these points will be measured and the environmental systems will control against them and you'll have an alarm if they go out of range. And hopefully all this data would be open source and you would create these like benchmarks that people would compete against. I think we're moving to that world. And I call that a world of evidence-based design through the golden thread and evidence-based control and operation. And there, building owners find out who's bullshitting and who's not, right? Who's building the good buildings, who's not? Who's controlling it, who's not? Who's the good engineer, who's not? I don't think that world is as far away as you think. And... Uh, it's going to make people realize how much we've all been winging it till now. <laughs> yeah. The only, the big challenge and a lot of that is the lobby groups um, yes. that will fight that tooth and nail. Oh yeah. And I'm hoping for society that uh, they lose. And uh, because right now they're winning, you know, yeah. I, I think when I go back, this is going back now, I think 15, 20 years ago, when there was a movement to try to increase the R value in residential buildings and the lobby group for the National Association of Home Builders, Joe, down in your area, you know, fought it. Hmm. Tooth and nail. They just said, no, it'll, it'll increase costs. It's the same thing with fire suppression systems in residential buildings. You know, yeah. they fought that one because it'll just increase costs. I mean, some areas, will, you know, will allow it and promote it, but other areas just not in our house. You know, so we that's, you know, the, the cost is an important factor. If we if we make things so expensive that no one can buy them, um, that's going to be a problem. You know, yeah. uh, although I I don't agree with using the cost, to, you know, as the only reason for not doing something. Yeah, so this is I, the dark, dark arts of um, promotion coming as well. Right. So someone put up on LinkedIn the other day, a Toronto cost consultant put up broke down the cost of a high-rise condo. So it turns out construction is about 45%, soft cost design about 12%, developers profit about 10 to 15. 24 to 27% is government fees and taxes. Just in the construction. <clears throat> this isn't property tax afterwards, right? 
So if you're spending 400 grand on a condo in Toronto, 25% of that is taxes and fees. Wow. Right? Yeah. So that's probably not dissimilar to any other jurisdiction in North America, right? Yeah. You know, you've got to get that money somewhere. So, well, you know, I was going to add to that, that, you know, when you, when you develop a set of skills between design work yeah. and you look at people that want to do cost cutting, there's lots of areas when you look at poor design, poor assemblies that add to that cost, but good engineering can remove it, you know? And the thing is that people need to understand, and particularly in the residential side, when someone comes to build a house, they've got a checkbook, old term, right? But they've got a, they've got a value of money sitting in a bank account, either it's finance or that's sitting there or it's a joint of something. They're going to spend the money one way or another, right? Yeah. And we have all these people, particularly in the, the mechanical trades, you know, trying to save people money, right? These are people that are trying to be the financial advisors for really wealthy people. And it's just, you know, when I look at designs, I know I can easily find like on a residential system, sometimes five to 10% of the value of that system is wasted because it's oversized equipment, in, um, improper selection of equipment, redundant systems that aren't necessary. There's lots of places to save money without compromising the quality of a project. You know? I, yeah, I, th there's so much that can be done and so much is not being done. Lobbying is a big factor in North America. Mm -hmm. I think the only way this changes is where, when owners of homes and users of homes that educate to the point on IOQ, IEQ, and you know, where the costs really go, that they demand things. You know, if there's a buyer strike on houses, things will change pretty damn quick, right? You know, you mm -hmm. stop buying something, it's, it's amazing how fast industries and lobbying groups change. But until that time comes, you know, it's it's got to be demand-driven, I think. Well, that's where Joe's comment about yeah. K through 12, like educating yeah. people while they're in that time of their life where they're learning about stuff. Because they, they leave at high school and they don't know how to buy a house. No. They haven't got a clue. But if you make it part of the science curriculum, that's that's brilliant, Joe. I, I think it would also help them help us improve our school buildings because if these kids start to learn this shouldn't be this way, and then they push their parents, well, the parents are paying the taxes and they're electing the school board. You'll get better school buildings as well if you start to teach these young people. It, it's really uh, odd that every school building I've ever worked on, I avoid them like the plague nowadays. They are the ones that are value engineered down to absolutely worse than residential, which I didn't think was possible. But they're value engineered below that. Do you know what I mean? It's amazing how bad they are. Yeah. You know, I got – go ahead, Robert. I, I, I just have two questions for you. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, we – Bill Bonfleff has been doing just a yeah. – I don't know. There's like, he needs a kind of like a humanitarian award for the work that he's done in COVID and yeah. educating. Yeah. But part of his, his um, uh, programs outreach has been with the school systems. And we had him on twice, one for the province of Alberta, one for the province of British Columbia. And it was a addressing uh, bad information that was coming from school board trustees and operators and facility managers. And it was, Amazing how many people within the school system that were designing and operating buildings thought that the ash that if they were designed to ASHRAE standards that they that it's adequate, and people needed to know that the ASHRAE ventilation rates weren't to deal with pathogens no. at all. You know, and so we had school board officials saying to the parents that your kids are fine, they're safe, they've been designed to ASHRAE standards. Well, as anybody that's been listening to the programs know, ASHRAE standards are on a continuum, they get updated. So when was that building built? And what were the rates at that time? And then secondly, the rates weren't sufficient for dealing with pathogens anyway. So bullshit. <laughs> and are you are you actually getting those rates? Um, that's yeah, where your commissioning that's and, and ongoing commissioning comes in. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It was designed, but that brings up one of the things I wanted to mention. I don't know if you're familiar with Haven IAQ. Uh, we had them on the show not long ago, and they're doing exactly what Adam talked about. They're, they're putting sensors in the ductwork that will help not only evaluate the indoor air quality, but also can make the adjustments to the system. So if your relative humidity is too high, they can, you know, 
tweak the dehumidifier to drop it a little bit. Um, I, I agree. I think we'll see more and more of that as time goes on. Whether it will be open source or not, I don't know how you get to that point, that Adam. But um, I guess maybe the the universities and and uh, you know the research people are going to have to drive that. Yeah, I, open source is such a great idea, but everyone resists it, right? Because you know they want to try and keep their information proprietary and make it money out of it. But just if you could open source just basic stuff like basic EUI, you know, energy mm. use intensity for building types and then have that out there that designers can then reference and benchmark and then claim they're beating it or not. That would be something, right? But uh, it's, 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 it would take a driver, a very high powerful level, like the president of Ashray make that one of their things during their term or something, you know, that's the sort of power you need behind that. Well, and one of the things that kind of demonstrates how difficult that is, we can't even get research to be open source. I, I've got to pay to get a paper to to help people understand certain topics, and that's uh, don't, don't get me started on that one, Joe. That, that whole <laughs> topic pisses me off. Um, there was an architect, and I can't remember her name right now, and forgive me, but we were at a conference, and she said, and then some, with an expletive deleted, <laughs> for God's sakes, we're trying to save the planet. Share your information. <laughs> Yep. There was an F word in there somewhere. <laughs> it's, it's just crazy. Yeah, you know, and so I wrote an article about that, about having to pay for research work. And, and I think my, my final conclusion was I bought shares in the publishing houses because it's the only way I could finance my purchases of the papers that they were selling. <laughs> hey, I, I got a question for both of you. You. Yeah. You both have more of a worldview. You're not, you know, just focused on America or the U.S. Or, or, or even North America. Are you seeing this being done right anywhere else as far as building better buildings, having more sensors in the buildings that help control different parameters? Uh, is any part of the world or any country in the world doing a better job in your mind than the rest? So I'll take that if you want, Robert. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because um, so I'm seeing in the in the UK. So we got to understand about North America is I've worked in 20 countries now, right? And the price, there's a reason. So I'm a Canadian and a Brit, right? Although I've got this British accent. Although I'm not, I'm told I don't have that anymore when I go back to the UK. Um, <laughs> the the North America is blessed. Right. I know people won't believe this, but the cost of energy is really low in North America and the living is good and the resources are high. Right. So when you go to the UK, um, the cost of energy is actually a lot higher and it's a factor in thinking in buildings. Right. So consequently, there's a lot more attention on energy efficiency and how buildings are built and air tightness and things like that. Right. So. There is, it's driven by economics normally, right? If things are expensive, then solutions arrive to mitigate them, right? So one of the problems North America has, it's blessed with an abundance of cheap energy. It's got a lot of resources. When you go to other parts of the world, it's not that way. So I see like in the UK, there's a lot more, buildings tend to be done to, um, high levels of efficiency, better standards of construction, not because they're Brits and they're great, because that's driven by input costs like energy and there's less layers of governments so that building regulations or building code are changed a lot more frequently there with less resistance and lobbying. So, you know, that's that's where I see it. I mean, Denmark has a, is probably one of the leaders, world leaders hmm. in... Uh, driving change you know getting yeah. off of, of uh, hydrocarbons for conditioning yeah. buildings uh, integrating uh, societies through their district energy and co-generation systems you know they've got a mandate to be off natural gas actually it's right it's very quickly i think it's in 2025 or something like that like it's coming up and so you know when you think about their drive for wind power photovoltaics um, they generate power from their waste systems. You know, they, they're, I, I would say out of all the countries around the world that I'm familiar with, Denmark is probably one of the leaders 
Joe, yeah. you know, and the, so you, and you see the architecture that's developed over there and it's all based on long-term visions, low, uh, lots of, you know, I mean, conservation is one thing, efficiency is another one, and then extra efficiency is another one. We won't try to get into that today, but all of their buildings have an ethos of conserve energy. When we use energy, we have to use it efficiently. And when we do convert it, we have to be able to extract the maximum amount of work out of it. That really, that country is defined by those three principles. It's the signals of cost and regulation, right? Mm. So the cost and building code would be the way to describe that in North American terms. And um, that's really what drives it. And that's why I think, and I'm not saying this because I'm a Brit, I think building efficiencies and construction standards are a lot higher certainly in the UK and Europe, not because they're better than North America, it's just because the drivers are different. Mm. The cost of energy are higher. The building regulations are different, right? So they respond to that. I mean, constructors all around the world are the same. They want to do minimum compliance, right? So it's, it's, it's also a cultural phenomenon. You know, what will your culture put up with in terms of construction, right? And then... In North America, you know, it's blessed. We got low resources in North America. I mean, I live in Canada, right? It's a great country. I emigrate here for a reason, right? Mm. It's a great country. We got oil, we got resources, we got space. Cost of energy is low. I know most people find that difficult to believe, but it is. The cost of gas for your car is low. And, you know, we are blessed in North America and that can be a curse in terms of trying to move the needle on building efficiency, right? So for example, Radiant heating and cooling solutions are very common in other parts of the world I've worked, not in North America, right? Everything is let's blow air at it. So there's a couple of reasons for that. One is energy is cheap in North America. And two, the manufacturing and the procurement process is geared up for that. So when I first moved to North America and started working on projects, you know, you'd be in design meetings. I go, let's do radiant. And you know it's not going to happen, radiant heating and cooling, because the supply chain is so optimized for air systems, right? There's also legacy issues. So, you know, really price is the best driver of everything, right? Until energy costs in North America go right up, I don't think a lot is going to change, unfortunately. I'm curious. I don't know if either of you get to the Middle East or to China or evaluate how they're handling these issues. I, I get the impression in the Middle East they're innovating. Um, they have energy, obviously. They don't maybe have to innovate as much as we do, but they seem to be doing it anyway. Is that window dressing or is that a serious you know, effort? It's a serious effort, but it's driven by different factors. So yes, there's a lot of energy there and it's cheap and it's heavily subsidized for local users. Um, however, you know, the climate is harsh, but they're, they're in the business of attracting investment, foreign direct investment and people. And one of the ways they do that is by being as first world and progressive in terms of built environment, as an example, as possible, right? So, you know, they compete over there on number of green buildings, number of the gold buildings, you know, things like that. But there's also behind that, there is a recognition. I mean, I've been going to the Middle East for the last 25 years as a professional. There's also a recognition of an energy transition coming down the pipe as well. Mm. You know, of moving away from hydrocarbons, you know, it's probably the last generation over there that's going to have an abundance of cheap energy i would say adam you we had a guest on i don't remember if it was seed or if it was a holly chant um and they were talking about in the early days of the development of dubai how much uh north american architecture influenced their architecture mm -hmm. and how they realized after several years of operating these all glass buildings they said yeah this isn't going to work for us in our climate zone it was time to go back to vernacular architecture which works for us for thousands of years yeah um so maybe part of this innovation that we're seeing, Joe, over there has as actually a result of, well, we went down one path that didn't work for us. So let's yeah. fix this and not do the same thing going forward. Interesting. What about China? Same question. China. I've never worked in China. I've worked in Taiwan and I've worked in other parts of Asia. China is really cost driven and it's not their environmentalism is driven by necessity, not 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 desire so they are actually ahead in many areas but um it's driven by cost and lack of resources rather than you know like oh i want to be the trendiest greenest place on the planet mm -hmm. so uh, but i haven't got any real direct experience in china um 
but you know the scale of things over there is is enormous i mean there are like 10 million person cities over there that no one's ever heard of and there's hundreds of them it's hard really? to describe the scale of what goes on there to us in north america who have space and you know it's just another world it quite frankly is but i worked in taiwan did a project in taiwan that was interesting and um there's a lot of but let's talk about the environmental movement and lead for a second, right? So I, I blow between total uh, at it and admiration for it. It sort of goes backwards and forwards for me, right? So what is really where it does work is it's aspirational and it moves the needle in places where um, energy is cheap. It gives you a way to compete on something, right? So you know, there's a lot of that going on in the world certainly in Asia and certainly in the Middle East, you know, is my building gold? Is it net zero? I think that is a much bigger driver nowadays than people realize in terms of moving the needle forward and getting things better in terms of our outcomes and performance. And Asia has an abundance of good engineers and an abundance of willpower to want to do it. And I think the plus side to all these um, green building certifications and net zero certifications is they're aspirational and engineers and clients in Asia are jumping on that bandwagon and it's it's having a real positive effect. Um, the downside to them schemes is that a lot of them are BS and there's a lot of BS in, within them, right? But net net, I think they're a positive in terms because they're aspirational and where energy is cheap, they they provide a reason to move the needle right in the right direction. I do know that uh, about uh, 12 years ago, we had representatives from uh, China uh, participate in our uh, standard 55 committee, which is the yeah. thermal environmental conditions for human occupancy. And the reason why they were there is because they were writing their own standard hmm. uh, for China, which ultimately got published. And um and I, and I, the reason why I say that is that um, they're not readily supportive of sending delegates from China to participate in these uh, standard organizations unless there's a good reason for it, you know. And yeah. uh, and I can tell you that the the communications that we had with the individuals um, was sensitive. You know, they they held the, the the document and the development of the document very close to their chest. Um, they were willing to share, but they knew they had to share in order to get information as well, right? So they understood the communication, but they were also very guarded about it, and they were also very sensitive in terms of um, having that freedom to come over and participate in the organization, and then to go yeah. back and then to write their own standards. So I think. Um, I mean, it's a big country. And like Adam, like you said, there's a population is very high and they're very, very small influence, but they, they are making steps to improve buildings for sure. And it's driven by need, right? I mean, there's a, in North America, we're very resource blessed. So a lot of our work is aspirational and morally sort of driven. Whereas in some parts of the world, it's absolutely required to be mm. energy efficient and move the needle fast as possible, right? And China is a good example of that. You know, there's a massive population there and a move to the cities, you know. So there are just massive cities over there you've never even heard of. They've got millions and millions of people in. It's just hard to freaking fathom, actually, how big that place is and how populated it is. So, you know, anything that moves a needle for me is good. But, you know, it's the sustainability movement. I love the ethos of it. But every building is local right every economy is local and you're responding to the local constraints and demands so you know what i've come to realize since i've lived in north america how blessed we are in canada and america with you know geography natural resources you know even war right to invade north america you've got to get across two massive oceans well that's pretty pretty tough so you know, yeah it's, this is a reason I moved from the UK to Canada, mate. Believe me, there, there was a lot of thought that went into that process. <laughs> and uh, I mean, keep in mind that we live in a world where, you, if you want to look at, at if you want to look at two end, two bookcase ends, yeah. North Korea, South Korea. Yeah. Yeah. 
right? Mm -hmm. I mean, South Korea is advanced. They're big push on proper architecture, indoor environments, conservation of energy. You know, they're they're a great country. And then on the other side of the border is like the dark ages. Yeah, yeah. You know? I wonder, have either of you um, experienced with India? Because, you know, when, when you're looking at sustainability, the three big, you know, the big, big drivers or the big users, I guess I could say, is China, India, and North America. What's going on with India? I've been there. I uh, did a, a small project there. It was actually a digital manuals project. But I've got a friend who lives there. So India is just basically a case of too many people and not enough stuff, right? <laughs> it's just... Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they're trying to move the needle, but it's really, really hard. Um, and a tough environment on top of that. Tough environment. Um, they got mineral, uh, they got population constraints in terms of a lot of people. They got a lot of resource constraints. They're in a tough neighborhood. You know, it's a real tough nut to crack. There's a and, lot of frustrated scientists in India because yeah. they, they have the knowledge. They know, well, then they, A, they're, they're, they are smart people, you know, and yeah. they've come up from one of the oldest civilizations on the planet. They understand economics, they understand science, they understand social issues, they understand a lot of things, and they see other parts of the world evolving. And, you know, we see these individuals that come again to our meetings, and they're as smart as the smartest people, you know, around. And they have a hard time within their own boundaries, their own borders making these changes because it is such a big machine i mean it's a, it's, a, it's a billion plus population right it's it's the scale of it is until you go there and just see how many people there are everywhere and you know how you even accommodate that many people to stand a living that we have in north america is probably impossible actually you know so it makes moving the needle on the built environment difficult right because there's there's stratas there's like there's a certain amount of population just surviving and then, you know, having a nice energy efficient anything just doesn't even register. And then, but there is a middle class, emerging middle class and upper class that are interested and in trying to move that needle, but it's a tough nut to crack and it's going to take time. A lot of poverty and that, that really makes everything harder when you're just trying, like you said, when you're just trying to feed yourself and your family and, and have a, some kind of shelter, um, you know, you'll do whatever it takes. And that's, that's a shame. Yeah. Um, gentlemen, I've got a, I think we're gonna have to wrap up here pretty soon. John, I know has to get ready to put, uh, put a show up for us. We're going to do a flashback this week. Um, I, I've had a great time. I don't know if you have any final questions or thoughts. Yeah, I do. I, well, I do want to send our regards up to Cliff and it's unfortunate we weren't able to talk to him today yeah. and, uh, but send our regards to him, uh, do miss talking, uh, hearing his voice and, um, you know, and again, Congratulations, uh, Joe, on just, you know, you guys have been leaders and uh, it's just awesome to see you guys do what you do. And yeah, thanks you know, what's awesome, Robert, we're, we're actually not losing money. <laughs> 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 Thank you, uh, sponsors. Yay. I love you all. <laughs> we're not making money, but we're not losing money. And that's, <laughs> That is a big change over the last 16 years. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you know what? Salute for being going for 16 years. I didn't really, I know you've been going a while. I didn't realize it was that long. So yeah. well done on that, man. That was talk about yeah. first to market there. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, the only comment I, I guess, other than that, is that I think every once in a while, Joe, um, you and Cliff and Adam and I ought to get together. I don't yeah. know, make it an anniversary thing every three, four years or something to see what catch up. What we should do is the Built Environment State of the Union address. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, I think it would be great to have Cliff on. He has a, yeah. a tremendous perspective, and um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to do that again real soon. Yeah, yeah. awesome. How long has the edifice complex? How long have you guys have been around a little while now? Yeah, we five years, maybe. Okay. Like so we're 60, six years nearly, actually. So we, we, we only post one a month. So when we started, we wanted to make it so we could be consistent. So we settled on one a month because obviously we're both working at the time and, you know, got careers to manage. And uh, we sort of stayed with that. Mm -hmm. um, now and again, we do a few special episodes, but generally we stay with that. So we've been around a long time. But in terms of 
absolute numbers, no, nowhere near your benchmark, right? You guys have been pumping it yeah. out wholesale. I salute to that as well. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's some people, you know, we get people that will call and they're starting a new podcast. And, you know, do you have any tips? And I, I, I tell them, number one, don't expect to make any money. <laughs> Secondly, it's a lot harder getting a guest week after week after week than you would realize. So your once a month was a brilliant decision. Uh, you know? And um, you're going to put a lot of time and effort into it. And uh, you've, you've got to be consistent. You've got to plug away and uh, keep at it, you know, and, yeah. Over time, yeah. things turned around for us, and uh, we're doing fairly well. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that, that when you look at your show and our show, we do it because we care. You know, yeah. we do it because we want to make a difference. Uh, you know, one of the ethos of our podcast is it was to leave behind a legacy of voices, you know, that uh, was timeless, you know, and yeah. as you have done, I mean, your archives is a, it's a library that uh, the information that from your show day one uh, is still relevant today and will be relevant in a hundred years from now. Well, that's, thank you. Yeah, we, uh, that's admirable. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree. That's why we do it. Yeah. We, we got some great people like yourself and now Adam on the show. And uh, it's uh it's a labor of love. We'll, we'll keep it up <laughs> as long as we can. <laughs> that right. Okay, man. So thanks very much for that. And, uh, Let's call it a wrap. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reel saying thanks for listening.